Welcome everybody to this Bitcoin having party. Welcome to our buddies. I'm gonna make this mighty hearty. Welcome on behalf of Father, the exchange with a little bit of swagger. We're gonna be joined by our friends from CoinEd. And we'll be talking about the Fed. Oh yeah, money over here, money over there, money everywhere. We're gonna be talking about Bitcoin scarcity. 
to bring you a little bit of felicity, oh yeah. Allow me to leave you with one point, please. You ain't gonna find any better maker fees. I said you won't find maker fees like these. No, you won't find maker fees like these. Let's get this uh, party started. We'll make it light, 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 light hearted. We're gonna get this party started and make it light hearted. Welcome everybody to this Bitcoin Harvey party. Welcome everybody to this Bitcoin Harvey party. Hey, 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 hey. All right, welcome everybody. Let's see if I can get this wig off and introduce myself. Uh, my name is Farzam Hassani. Uh, I'm the Valor CEO and co-founder. Um, it's really a great pleasure to be with all of you today. We've got a, a really nice uh, setup and a little, really nice program. Um, I hope you enjoyed that little, little serenade for you. Um, let me bring in my colleagues. So I'd first like to welcome uh, Badi Sadakran. Badi, very, very welcome. Uh, Badi is our Chief Product Officer. So welcome, Badi. Badi, I think you're on mute, by the way. Uh, and then let's bring in... Uh, there you go. Beautiful. Beautiful. Gianluca or G. G is our Head of Finance. So welcome, G. He's from Valor as well. Give me one sec. <laughs> hey everyone can you hear me <laughs> awesome i can hear you buddy that's perfect and then um in addition to uh the three of us from valor we are very excited to bring in our friends from coined so we have uh warren where's warren let's get warren over here Warren, very, very welcome. That's Warren from CoinEd, and that is hey, uh, hey. welcome. And then we also have Creon from CoinEd. Very welcome, hey, guys. Let's stop. Let's get this party started. Right. So, um, just to give a little bit of a of an overview to um, to everybody about what the agenda is today, we're gonna have for about the first half an hour. We're gonna have a, a little bit of a chat. We're gonna look over um, some of the uh, some of the, the, the comments over here to kind of see what you guys are talking about. Have, happy halving, and we'll, we'll talk really focus on what the halving means uh, for the Bitcoin community, etc. And then after that, around 12:30, we're going to be starting with a, a really great course that the CoinEd guys have put together. I have a lot of respect for these guys, and just so that you know, they are CoinEd is a company that does a lot of educational initiatives for the the crypto and the Bitcoin space, particularly. Um, they were the first guys that I know of that have been into high schools in South Africa and Kenya, teaching high school kids about the future of money and cryptocurrency. So we're really, really excited to have them on board. And they're going to have a, a bit of a formal program for you guys about uh, kind of some of the basics about crypto. So, so it will be really for, um, for some of the beginners, but it should be, should be really great. So let me pause there and then hand it over to one of you guys, maybe Baddy, Gianluca, whoever. Maybe we've got some really exciting competitions as well. So, um, Baddy, why don't you kick it off and tell us a little bit about the, the first competition? All right. Um, the first actually is going to be the last competition uh, of the event, which is uh, Ledger Nano up for grabs. Uh, uh, it will be a raffle. So the registrations are still open until about 12.30. After that, we will be selecting uh, one of the attendees who has also registered on Eventbrite to give away the Ledger Nano S. That'll be that'll happen at the end of the event. So stick around until the end. Awesome. And then uh, Warren, tell us a little bit about uh, the spot prizes. Yeah. So um, that is going to be giving away a number of spot prizes today. It's going to be 100 rand worth of uh, Bitcoin, which at this moment is 62,000 sats. 
Um, to get the spot prizes, uh, you need to just put in a comment. If your comment is selected and put up on the main screen, you're gonna get a spot prize. We're gonna ask a number of questions. If anyone gets any of those right, uh, you're gonna get a spot prize. And uh, likewise, if, uh, if you uh, ask a question of us and then we'll answer that, that's also get you a spot prize. So that is gonna be handing those out. In order to get the spot prizes, you do need to have a Valor address and you'll need to provide that in the chat. Uh, and then the Valor guys will send over your, your 100 Rand. Why, why don't we do it right away? So give a spot prize away. Okay. Awesome. Let's get this party started. Let's get Let's this party started. Let's get a comment. Let's get a comment from someone. Yeah, so just to be clear, guys, so if you sign into your Valor account, go to your uh, – uh, the, your wallet screen and go to your deposit address for your Bitcoin. The first person to post that up on the chat will get a hundred rands worth of some Satoshi, some Bitcoin. So let's see, let's see who that is. Um, cool. So as we're waiting for that, um, let's also talk a little bit about the third prize, which will be giving a, another legend nano out. Uh, and effectively that will be uh, on social media post this, uh, this live stream. Um, so that's going to be our, our grand prize too. And again, it's another legend Anna that's going to be given out on social media. So, so please look out on that for both the, the valor.com as well as the, the coined uh, uh, social media handles there. So, so very welcome. So guys, let's start a little bit with Warren. Let me ask you, um, uh, I'll, I'll say a few words about valor later, but let's get straight into the, 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 the Bitcoin halving. What is the Bitcoin halving to you? Tell us a little bit about what you've seen. You talked a little bit about a transaction. That we've today. Just what are your thoughts generally about the Bitcoin halving? Yeah, I think it's a tremendously important event that kind of goes by, not with a bang, but with a whimper. And then later we see a massive impact on the Bitcoin market, or historically we have seen that. Um, it's got a bit of a, I guess, a following around it. And people in the space tend to go and... Uh, uh, watch block explorers and see how long it's going to be till the next block is mined to get down to the point past the halving. Personally, I thought it would be pretty fun to try and get a transaction into the into the halving block. That's when the block reward goes from 12.5 down to what it is now, which is uh, 6.25. Um, and I tried my best to get a a transaction in there. I put a 300 Satoshi per byte transaction in, but there was so little time between blocks that I actually missed it. So I got in on the 630,000th and first block. So I just missed it. It's a bit bit geeky, but I was, I was keen to get my, my transaction into the halving block, which would obviously stay there forever. Awesome, awesome. Thank you so much. Gianluca, let's bring you in over here. Tell us a little bit of your thoughts. And maybe tell us about why you're in crypto altogether. Yeah, I'm going to take this hat off because I'm actually dying underneath this. <laughs> um, but, so this what happens when you have hair. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, so this, I'm sorry to say, is going to be my first halving, actually. Um, so I was sat right here last night waiting for um, the halving block to actually be mined. Um, I must admit I was a little bit nervous. Uh, just afterwards, because I think it took about 40 minutes for a block to be mined after we got past the halving block. Yeah. Um, so there's a little bit of uh, <laughs> trepidation right there. But um, I think uh, there's just so much going on in this industry right now that's that really, and in the world actually, that kind of makes, but brings Bitcoin to the fore for a lot of people. Um, um. So I think if we're going to speak very briefly about... Uh, I must admit, I was a little bit nervous uh, just afterwards because I think it took about 40 minutes for a block to be mined. After I'm not sure why we're hearing you again. Um, but yeah, so um, if, we just, if I just highlight the reason that I'm in this industry, um, I think the world is moving towards a place where we need safe haven assets. Um, and for me, Bitcoin ticks a bunch of boxes um, for, that, for that purpose. Um, awesome. So yeah, yeah. I think uh, Barry, I'll bring you in. Let me just say a few words about uh, about Valor as well, and kind of uh, why this is a kind of a significant. Uh, I'd say it's, it's a significant kind of indication of why we're in this industry. So, I think first of all, I just wanted to also wish everybody well. I think the, the world's in a in a difficult state right now with with COVID, and most of you, or probably all of you, are are actually uh, kind of tuning in from home. 
Um, and what we've seen is unprecedented amounts of, of fiscal stimulus uh, across the world. So from the Federal Reserve to uh, Europe to Asia, et cetera. And uh, to be honest with you, when you're sitting in the seat of central bankers, you're left with actually very little uh, options as to what you can do. You've got very few tools to deploy to help the world in its current financial system. So I, I, do, I do think that central bankers are doing their best and they really do have uh, the best interest of humanity at heart. However, for the most part, let me say for the most part, but however, I do think that we are living in a financial system that is uh, precarious at best. And you know, with the amount of trillions of US dollars that have been kind of pumped out into the world economy over the last few weeks, if we look at the stock market prices that have been going up, I mean, we, when we saw the, uh, the unemployment figures from the U.S. coming out, over 20 million people unemployed for the, for the month of April, and yet that day the stock price went up. Uh, it's, it's just it's a strange, strange time we're living in. So one of the reasons that we started Valor was to get really the public uh, able to get have an on-ramp into an ecosystem uh, that we believe is very promising and, and, and by all indications looks to be what the future financial system may look like. It may look very different to Bitcoin itself or all the other cryptos, but cryptography and as, as an underpin to money is a very, very powerful concept. And so we, we hope that you guys are enjoying the platform and finding it easy to kind of uh, buy and sell Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies. If you have any feedback for us, we're always, always here to, to listen to that. We, we love your feedback. So, um, so yeah, I think we're in the next few years, uh, I'm a little bit concerned about what all this money in the system means for inflation. Having said that, we're also seeing a recessionary effects. So there might be a, a dampening of demand, which could see prices actually go down and not hyperinflate. Uh, but we are also seeing um, kind of the supply chains and our on our demand side being affected. So. I think if anybody says they know exactly what's going to happen, that is that is false. We're all kind of doing our best to understand what the what the reality on the ground is. But um, Bitcoin should certainly have a, a a place. And I think most people would have seen that Paul Tudor Jones. If you don't know who he is, he's one of the biggest uh, macro investors. Uh, you know, over the past few decades, recently he came out. I think it was yesterday he came out and said between one to two percent of his portfolio is now in Bitcoin. So we should also expect to see more institutions coming into the cryptocurrency space and the Bitcoin space as a hedge to the traditional financial system in many ways. Betty, anything else? I'm, really, I'm going to also just monitor some of the questions here and then bring them up. All right. Um, just regarding the halving, I was uh, watching the halving happen uh, as it happened yesterday at uh, 9.23 South Africa time. And uh, G and I were looking at it and the uh, Coinbase transaction for the block that was mined, uh, the the new block that was mined at that time had uh, half the amount of the miner reward. So we were calculating about the miners were getting hundred twenty thousand uh, dollars up until then, and now they're getting around sixty thousand dollars per block mined. Uh, it, time will tell what that means for the number of miners that are going to stay or go out of business or whatever. It will also affect the difficulty level com coming up. So um, unless the price doubles, I think many of these uh, uh, miners might have to shut their operations. But uh, time will tell. And it's interesting times for both for Bitcoin as well as the world at large with uh, the crisis that we are in. Awesome. So guys, we I think there was quite an interesting uh, um, in the actual block that was mined. I think F2 Pool was the miner that actually mined the, the block on halving. Um, and yeah. they had, do, do they want to remember it was, it was the actual cool. message that they wrote? Uh, yeah, I actually got the message written here. Well, it is New York so Times, 9th of the, April, 2020, with $2.3 trillion injection, Fed's plan far exceeds 2008 rescue. And, and that's yeah, that for the new point. That's in reference to the Coinbase transaction and the Coinbase transaction uh, or the Genesis block uh, of the Bitcoin blockchain basically made allusions to a bailout uh, in 2008 uh, from, um, from the central banks to kind of the, the, the financial system that I was, was having difficulties that time. So that was kind of a tribute to that initial uh, transaction or, or um, 
or message in the Bitcoin blockchain. So, guys, I see the first. Uh, I see the first um, Bitcoin deposit address here from Ken. I think it is a twelve ten. Um, so we'll check that out. I see some some of you are actually posting your your uh, deposit codes or your referral codes. Please don't post those. Post your actual Bitcoin deposit address. You need to go to your wallet screen, click on Deposit Bitcoin, and then you can click uh, and copy the uh, the long string of letters and numbers there, which is your uh, your Bitcoin address. So um, so Ken, congrats to you. Um, and then there was also some other question that I wanted to put up here about kind of investing at this time or putting your money in into this. Um, how about this one with uh, from Brendan? Let's do it. Okay. How has COVID impacted valid transactions? I have more people signed up. So um, the short answer is we are very, very fortunate to be in that subset of businesses right now that have been doing at least surviving and in some cases thriving because of the unfortunate conditions of the world right now. So we're very, very grateful for that. What that means is the Valor, uh, the Valor um, transactions have gone up, the trading volumes have gone up. Over the last 24 hours, we've done about 17 million Rand of trading uh, on the platform and our signups have been at their highest uh, of all time. So we're seeing every few minutes someone signing up to Valor, which we're again, very, very grateful for. Um, and just making sure that we can uh, actually our support desk and our platform is up to scratch. So we're actually investing more and soon we will actually be hiring some uh, support staff, some more support staff, just to make sure that we're always ahead of the curve here. Um, so it's, it's, uh, we're very, very blessed. We, we do understand also that, um, that, uh, you know, many people are not in the position of valor or many businesses are not in the position of valor. So hopefully our low fees are, are helping. We really want to keep those, fees as low as possible, which we've done. Um, so hopefully you will you'll, you appreciate that. Guys, there's a question here. So just, I think, the, uh, another one um, uh, about kind of investing in Bitcoin versus other things. I think one thing just to make sure that everybody understands is that nobody can tell what the future of any price is. So if anybody, and this is also actually a thing to educate everybody on, what we see at Valor oftentimes is some of our customers get sucked in to people promising them high returns. If you ever see that, please be very, very wary because there's a very good chance that someone's going to try to get your money without, uh, you know, in, in, a, in an unfortunate way. So I think what we'll share here is going to be just really our individual opinions. Uh, the price of Bitcoin could go up, it could go down. Please be very careful as usual. One thing that I'm pretty sure of is that the volatility of Bitcoin will continue. So. So please be wise in, in, in how you buy and sell Bitcoin. So any any takers for this question, guys? <laughs> yeah, I think uh, I'll, I'll take a stab at that. So uh, when it comes to altcoins, you know, especially when, when Bitcoin pumps, there's a couple of narratives that uh, tend to permeate. The first one is that, uh, well, you know, Bitcoin is already too expensive. It's not going to go any higher. It's already, you know, $10,000 or at the time of the last um, market when it started pumping $1,000. And people think that that's just a very high price to pay and that it's not going to give uh, much in the way of returns. The other narrative that uh, tends to come out is that uh, Bitcoin network is slow and that transactions take a long time. And of course, these things are features. They're not bugs. Um, so I think because of that, there are a lot of people who enter the market into altcoins um, when Bitcoin runs, but ultimately um, it tends to be uh, dominated by movements in the in the Bitcoin space. Uh, personally, what I do is I use an index. Um, it's very hard to keep track of every altcoin and trying to buy and sell and bet on the, the ones that will ultimately um, become winners. So you can use an index. I mean, there's a good product out there called HODLBOT, which will rebalance your portfolio. And maybe it's worth just checking that out. It's a stress-free way of getting some exposure, but ultimately I'd say stack sets, build up Bitcoin, that's, um, that seems to be the best strategy in the long run. Cool. Anything else? G, do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, I think, I think like to kind of echo what Warren is saying, um, Bitcoin itself kind of solves a very specific problem. 
right? It's an inflation hedge. It's what we call digital gold for many people. Um, it's something that we know has a limited supply and we're very clear on um, its issuance schedule. Um, there's, a, there's, there's quite an interesting tweet that I saw a couple of days ago that said um, the US dollar is, uh, is safe and totally uncertain, um, whereas Bitcoin is something that's risky, um, but certain. So we know exactly how many Bitcoin are going to be issued over time. Um, it's, it's, it's very clear that the network works, um, that we get new blocks being issued roughly every 10 minutes. Um, and that's been chugging along for over 10 years now. Um, so I think for altcoins to have a position in a portfolio, you've got to think about what specific problem those coins are actually solving. Um, if they're just trying to compete with Bitcoin, they've got many unique features of Bitcoin to compete against. Um, and I think it's 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 quite a difficult uphill battle. Um, there are coins that try to solve different problems, and maybe they have different features. For example, privacy, um, and those could be quite interesting. Um, but I mean, for me, like again, this is not investment advice. Um, but I tend to focus on Bitcoin as the crypto that that solves the problem that I'm interested in. Um, I think that's my view. All right, cool. I think I get one, interesting, one interesting question I'd like to ask, actually, um, is that we've mentioned that, uh, that that Bitcoin blocks are mined approximately every 10 minutes, right? Um, and I think Bitcoin mining actually started on the 8th of January 2009. Um, so if we're adding four years to get to the next... 3rd of January. Uh, 3rd of January is when the first Bitcoin was issued, but I think actual mining started on the 8th. Okay. Um, the others got involved. Um, so... Okay. So if we if we project forward, we're on the third halving, so it should be 12 years. That would ex that we'd expect to be on the the 8th of January 2021 before we get to the current halving. And yet here we are, eight months early, celebrating the the the, the, the halving that that has just occurred. Um, does anybody have any thoughts on why that happened and and, and what that like tells us about uh, the network? Well, I think it has to do so. I'm not sure if anyone knows this, or I'm, I'm assuming many people actually do, but the um, Bitcoin blocks are expected to be generated every 10 or so uh, minutes. But what we have been seeing is that blocks are being generated around nine and a half minutes sometimes, um, or it's, it's tending towards a lower number. And as we introduce more powerful machines, that starts to drop a little bit for a certain period of time. So I think we obviously we are going to see discrepancies in what is expected. Um, it is all random, by the way. There, there is no uh, certainty on that number. So it's 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 quite exciting, and especially because uh, we a lot of people expected the halving to happen at around I think it was four o'clock today. Is that right, Warren? Our initial estimate was four o'clock, and it, it actually happened quite quickly. Right. And um, I'm going to talk a bit about that later. Yeah. <laughs> So everything is uncertain. Um, it is all based on uh, randomness uh, with regards to how quickly the box are, blocks are generated. Um, yeah, anything else to add? Yeah. yeah. Go ahead, Gene. Yeah, I think, I think like, so Bitcoin works on a, on a, a difficulty algorithm, right? Um, yeah. So that algorithm is supposed to keep blocks in check at about 10 blocks, uh, 10 minutes per block, sorry. Um, what we've seen is that the hash power, the amount of computers or money that miners are willing to throw at, at the Bitcoin network effectively, um, has been like shooting up ahead of any expectation, ahead of the difficulty adjustments. So it's, we're speaking a little bit about number go up um, in terms of the price of Bitcoin going up over time. But I think another thing that's really interesting is that the hash rate of the Bitcoin network, which indicates its health and indicates how much money people are willing to put behind mining blocks, has been shooting up over time too. Um, and that's been like a really healthy aspect of the Bitcoin network. And it's led us to being um, like eight months early on, on the current halving. All right, so I just and, wanted to address a couple of things. I, I see a lot of people were saying that they were before uh, Ken in with their Bitcoin address. So not to worry, we'll give Ken a prize. And if there is anybody that will go through the comments at the end and whoever was the first will make sure that uh, that uh, we give the first person a prize there. We've got many other spot prizes to give. So so don't worry about that. <laughs> also, please, Just before uh, we move on. 
so just before uh, yeah, move on uh, about the addresses, I can see people are still posting the deposit addresses. You can stop now until I mean get your deposit addresses ready until we announce the next spot price, and then we can see. <laughs> Cool. So there's I a question on uh, opening in other countries. I don't know if, if you guys can answer yeah. that. Sure. So, so basically, Valor right now is obviously South African based. We're a South African company. We're based in South Africa. Our offices are in Johannesburg. Um, we do actually have uh, aspirations to go global, and particularly within Africa and uh, and beyond. Um, the SADC countries we we are definitely considering. Right now, some of the challenges have to just do with banking relationships, so cross-border uh, kind of payments into and out of, so withdrawing is sometimes difficult. So we need to actually um, create some banking infrastructure within those countries. So as we move forward, we will make announcements about that in, in, as, uh, regarding which countries we go in, into. Um, it's also important to know that you know, starting a, a, uh, an order book or being able to sell crypto in a country in the local currency is not a trivial task, particularly if you want to provide an advanced trading book where people can see the, the buy orders and the sell orders, etc. cetera. So um, we, we do place a lot of emphasis into understanding the market and making sure that when we do go into other markets, we can do it in a very, um, <laughs> that's funny. Can you please make G put his, back, his hat back on? G, you've got a request, put your hat back on. Okay. Uh, <laughs> and um, so, so yeah. So the point is, we want to do it, but we want to do it in a responsible and, and fair fashion. So um, we will make announcements as and when we we do that. We we also have some uh, very exciting announcements to come up in the next few weeks. Um, I'm not at liberty to share that out, share that right now, but as soon as we are, it is about kind of our expansion plans. It's about uh, the people that we're going to be working with going forward. So we'll, we've got some exciting announcements in the next few weeks. So, <laughs> so stay tuned. I love those cool. ears. <laughs> I just wanted to bring this comment up quickly because I did notice it. Um, if anyone was actually watching the blockchain yesterday, we did see this happen where the, I think it was the last fourth, third and second block was actually mined in roughly 10 to 15 minutes time. And then the final block or the, or was it the first block? Yeah, first it was the first, the first block with the new That's reward was actually mined within roughly one minute. So it, it, it simply boils down to who finds the answer as quick as possible. And um, it happened to be F2 Pool that managed to do this in about one minute. So yeah, that's a, a great comment um, if anyone was watching the blockchain yesterday. Yeah. Cool, guys. So it's nearly um, it's it's nearly 12.30 when we're going to start the actual part of the program where the coin guys take us through their course. Um, I just wanted to, sh there was a couple other questions that I wanted to just bring up. Um, so just, I, I won't put them on the screen, but very quickly, some people asking about, you know, how much they can buy. I think it's important to note that you can buy less than one Bitcoin. The price of one Bitcoin is in the, you know, higher 100,000 uh, Rand mark right now, but you can buy as little as 10 Rand on, on the Bitcoin platform. Um, I really encourage you, please do not try to get rich quick with cryptocurrencies. Uh, we try to bring you a responsible product, uh, Valor, to try to bring you as many kind of uh, possibilities for you to, to buy and sell. But we also need to say that it's a volatile industry, it's a volatile asset class, and we don't see that changing anytime soon. So while we do expect the price to go up over time, there's a very good chance that it could be a, a pullback. So please be very wary. Uh, we, we really care about you guys as customers, and we want to make sure that the best thing is for you. And sometimes the best thing is not buying as much Bitcoin as you can. It's buying the amount of Bitcoin that's commensurate with your financial situation. That makes, uh, that makes it basically, if you lose a lot of it, it shouldn't affect you negatively. So please just keep that in mind. Um, thanks for all these encouraging announcements uh, or comments about loving Valor and ditching other platforms and because you couldn't turn back. <laughs> Those are, those are obviously very uh, uh, heartwarming. Um, all right, there's, there was one other question here. Um, so just, I think this is a, an important point here. Is there a road plan, any plan or roadmap for value to allow controlling one's own keys, uh, like shapeshift, uh, shapeshift with keep, keep key? So uh, this, uh, and, and Warren and Crian will talk about this, but effectively, 
One of the beautiful things about Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies is the fact that you can hold possession of your own currency. All right, so you can hold your own Bitcoin without relying on anyone else. Um, and that's what some, you know, Shapeshift is a, is a case in point there. Uh, they, they have uh, an exchange where they don't take on people's keys. But most uh, exchanges, centralized exchanges like Valor, we actually manage and secure the keys on behalf of our customers. So this is also to get the trading engine going quickly because with, you may have heard of decentralized exchanges, decentralized exchanges where you don't, uh, they don't have control of your private keys. The performance is much more impaired than on a centralized exchange. So centralized exchanges are much quicker, much quicker. But what that does mean is that we, we need to secure those keys. So right now, we don't have any plans of bringing that feature in. Um, Valor really takes a lot of uh, precaution. Basically, our business is predicated on the fact of creating a platform that you can use that's performant and then securing crypto assets as best as we can. So as you'll see on our website, we're, we're very open about this, about the security of our, of our crypto assets, where we have what's called multi-signature that's geographically dispersed across different institutional uh, kind of bank grade vaults where um, you know biometrics and face detection and identification and all these type of things are required to actually access this so it's it's a, it's quite a involved process to secure assets and one of the things that uh, the guys will talk about is the fact that people say don't leave your assets on an exchange uh, and I agree with that to a certain extent if you know what you're doing but if you don't know what you're doing with a private key, and you lose that private key, then you could lose all your money. So there's a trade-off between understanding what the risks are with leaving your coins on a particular exchange and also managing your coins yourself. There is no such thing as zero risk. You need to identify what the risks are, see who you're dealing with. You should do your due diligence on Valor, make sure you know who the people that are running Valor are, who our investors are, because they would have obviously done due diligence on us as well, just to make sure that you're comfortable and that goes uh, with all of the other exchanges as well. I think there's one more point there, um, a feature that's been requested by quite a few customers recently, actually, is the idea of actually bringing in a vault product um, where we can lock away crypto in cold storage for them. Um, so they've got comfort that their coins would not move um, until they until such time as they decide to request that their funds be removed from cold storage. So that's something that we're looking into, too. Cool. All right, so guys, we're going to hand it over to the Coinit guys. I just wanted to say, if you haven't already done so, please sign up at valor.com. Um, uh, so, so, or and subscribe to our channel. Um, and, and if you want to sign up, the, the sign up is just valor.com slash sign up right over here, as you can see that. Um, and so the, the spot prizes and things like that will be given to uh, customers that uh, post their Bitcoin deposit address on Valor. So please do that. It will take you about five minutes to, to sign up fully. So um, Warren and uh, Kriyan, um, I introduced you a little bit earlier and talked a little bit about how you guys have been doing some great educational work, particularly, particularly in high schools. You also do work for corporates. You also do work for um, uh, you know, different types of, of, of businesses uh, and individuals. Um, so... So I think maybe, let me pass it on to you. Maybe you want to get your presentation up. Let's bring this in, your presentation over here. Um, and, and why don't you guys take it over from here and then we'll, we'll chip in as we go along. Sounds good. Uh, thanks, thanks Fazan. Um, yeah, so CoinEd is, uh, it's actually um, a few of us. So Creon, myself, and then uh, Leeson is uh, in, the, in the background uh, helping us out. Um, with the comments and everything today and moderating. Um, Lisa, I don't know if you want to give us a shout out. I'll pin your, I'll pin your, uh, your message. Uh, yeah, so we started CoinEd in 2017. It was kind of a, amidst the, the bull run. There was a lot of excitement. And we really wanted to bring a lot of uh, teaching and education to, to the market in South Africa. <clears throat> what we found after that was that a lot of schools had a huge amount of interest where the interest into 2018 dropped off a bit with corporations they were buying into the blockchain hype and then schools suddenly showed a huge amount of interest because they were taking a long-term view on this technology so one of the projects that i think um i'm most proud of i see uh elise is um, putting in a comment for us here elise um <laughs> one of the comments it's a bitconnect reference for 2017 uh, people um 
one of the projects I was very proud of is we went up to uh, Kenya um, and taught at a high school in Nairobi and we did a full two week integration into the entire high school. So that everyone in that school did the course for two weeks. We built mining rigs with them. You can see there's a bunch of uh, Kenyan students from the Crawford International School in Kenya assembling mining rigs. We talked about cryptography, the maps behind it. And it was amazing how little they had to unlearn compared to the corporates we teach. Uh, so that was really a, a great experience. Um, let me maybe hand over to Creon to talk a bit about what else we uh, get up to. Yeah, cool. So um, when it comes to our corporate business, a lot of the time we just simply get to ask, ask the question about how cryptocurrencies and blockchains are um, have an effect on someone's business. So part of our offering is actually running hackathons or, or rather workshops in the form of a hackathon where we discuss um, with software developers and project teams, for example, on how to rapidly create a prototype that they can prove um, valuable or not to their business. And an a couple of interesting things that we've actually done. So uh, we worked with some smart energy metering companies to uh, try create smart meters that accept cryptocurrencies as payments. Um, we also did something for the, uh, uh, what is it, the creative industry um, for corp uh, sorry, for people that are produce content, music or videos and things like that, and timestamping that content onto a blockchain so that they can constantly prove into the future that they were the original creator. And then a very interesting project that we're working on with one of the um, IT companies and a bank in Kenya is actually trying to create software or programs for refugee banking. And that's specifically around credit scoring and uh, digital identity and things like that. So. It's, it's a very cool offering that we have for corporates, especially because people actually build things and uh, come out with a product at the end of the day. Great. Cool. Yeah, so I don't know, maybe... Uh, Let's get into the... Do you want to talk a bit about the competitions or...? I think I think let's get into the content and then we'll, we'll, we'll continue giving out uh, uh, some prizes. So go Great. Go ahead, Graham. Okay, cool. So let me just minimize something here. All right, cool. So let's start off with a simple question. What is Bitcoin? And a lot of people already know the answer to this, but for those of you who are pretty new to the industry, we often get the question about what is Bitcoin and who created it? And the funny thing is we actually don't know who created it apart from the pseudonym of Satoshi Nakamoto. And Satoshi Nakamoto is just this entity that nobody knows the identity of. Now, in 2008, <laughs> Fuzz, your kids are interested. <laughs> Guys, we're all, we're all real people here. <laughs> Do you want to say hi? Holly, you want to say hi? Say hi. Hi. No, he doesn't want to say hi. Go ahead. <laughs> cool, cool. All right, okay. So um, in 2008, Satoshi released what is known as the white paper for Bitcoin, detailing what Bitcoin uh, is and how it works. And um, I, we mentioned in 2009, the first Bitcoin uh, transaction was actually created. So what Satoshi defined Bitcoin as is a peer-to-peer -peer electronic cash system. And what this means is we don't need a, a bank or a third party entity between us. We are simply transacting between one another. And what makes this possible is the fact that uh, Bitcoin is a network, a peer-to-peer -peer network. Now, uh, Warren, if I can rather share my screen. Sorry, I'm just switching my screen on here. Cool. All right, it's coming up now. All right, cool. So let's talk about some of the players in the Bitcoin network. And um, I think this is important because uh, whether you are simply investing in crypto or becoming a miner, or if you're even a node, um, it's, good, it's good to understand the roles of the various players in the industry. So first of all, let's start talking about uh, wallets. And what is a wallet? Now, a wallet, just like you have a, a banking app that gives you access to your bank account and the details of your bank account, a wallet in the crypto industry does the same thing. Uh, 
except for the fact that a lot of people don't realize this, your wallet doesn't actually hold your Bitcoin. It is actually just proof that you own Bitcoin. And every time that you use your wallet, you're simply signing a transaction to tell the whole network that you own that Bitcoin and you have r the right to spend that money. Now, interestingly enough, Valor is also a type of wallet, but it is known as a, uh, a custodial wallet. So every time that you spend money from the Valor wallet, you are actually asking Valor to sign the transaction on your behalf. And uh, Fazam and uh, the rest of the team are actually going to talk about a bit more of their services a bit later. So let's, uh, one thing that we wanted to do was actually take you through the process of a transaction so that you can understand how it goes. Now, once you use, once you initiate a transaction on your wallet, um, your wallet, like I said, is actually signing off on the transaction and uh, providing authorization to the network or providing your authorization to the network to spend uh, money. And within the network, you have two entities that are, that are known as nodes and miners. Now, nodes, we're not gonna talk too much about, but nodes simply maintain and verify transactions on a blockchain. And um, they, contain, they hold the entire history of the blockchain, although you do get certain types of nodes that don't. And uh, if you have a full node on your machine, you can actually go back into history and check every single transaction that has happened on the Bitcoin blockchain. And uh, Warren, maybe you have a comment. Um, I, I think you're running a node on your machine, right? Yeah, so this laptop I'm streaming off is, uh, is a full node. Um, in fact, uh, a few months ago, we endeavored, a friend of mine went to Antarctica and it's the one continent in the world that doesn't have a Bitcoin node. And so we actually sent a full node with him to Antarctica. He was working there and uh, it became the first Bitcoin full node. So to shut down the Bitcoin network, you would have to find every node and there's probably between 10 and 100,000. Most of them, we don't know where they are. Um, you'd have to shut down every single Bitcoin node or destroy every miner distributed around the world to, to shut the Bitcoin network down. And well, you'd have to go to Antarctica now as well. <laughs> yeah, that's pretty cool. That's awesome. All right, cool. So uh, yeah, talking about the miners now. So the role of the miners in the crypto in the in the Bitcoin network and really any cryptocurrency network is to process transactions that are initiated by individuals within the network. So one thing that I haven't mentioned right now, um, I'm sure you can see my mouse, is the memory pool. Now the memory pool is this. You can imagine a cloud database that all miners and nodes have access to, and the role of the miner is to look into the memory pool and pull transactions from it that need to be processed. So every time I initiate a transaction, that transaction appears in the memory pool. Then the miner processes it. And the way the miner does this is the miner creates what is known as a block in the, in the blockchain. Now, in, in the previous slide I had uh, in the memory pool, there was transaction one and transaction two, et cetera. And you can imagine if I was a miner, I would take certain transactions and put it into a block. And that is effectively what a block in the blockchain is. It's a group of transactions that are processed together. Now, the incentive behind mining, and this is what is important about the halvening, is that the block reward is 12 and a half Bitcoin. And that means that every time a, bit, uh, a miner adds a block to the blockchain, they get an, a, a reward of 12 and a half Bitcoin. And by the way, that is uh, newly created Bitcoin. So, uh, what, what happens is there's an algorithm that uh, all the miners are trying to solve, and it's actually a, a relatively simple algorithm in computer terms, but it is also based on randomness. Um, you don't know what the output of the algorithm is going to be until you run the algorithm. So the purpose of mine is actually to become the first miner to find the correct solution. And in doing so, you get the ability to add the latest block to the blockchain. And because you are the one adding the block, you get the block reward. So once those transactions are actually processed, it gets removed from the memory pool. And the, the rest of the transactions, uh, uh, transactions are always updated. There's more being added, there's more being taken away all the time. So as a miner, I've, let's say, taken away two of the transactions now, and the following, uh, the next block is now created with the rest of the transactions. And I think uh, one thing to, in, that's important to mention is a miner will generally prioritize the transactions that have, that have the highest fees attached to them. So this, uh, I think uh, when, we, when we get into the later discussion, we can talk about how Bitcoin has trouble sometimes scaling when it comes to as many transactions. And I think this also has to do with Valor's uh, uh, withdrawal fees. So we'll get to that just now. Um, 
But at the end of the day, so if, if I've taken transactions from the memory pool now, I've processed them into a block, I've added them, I've received the block reward, all miners start working on the next block uh, on the next block now. So this will obviously carry on for the rest of the uh, Yeah. Can I it's throw in a fun fact quickly? Yeah, sure. Uh, related to the halving, so at the end of, uh, well, at the end of, we call it Epoch 1, so when we had the first halving, um, the block reward was, was 50 Bitcoin, a block, um, and the price of Bitcoin in dollars at that time was about $600, it was 606 if you want to be exact. Uh, sorry, the, the price was $12, 20, uh, 12 cents, um, which meant that the block reward in dollars was about $600, 606 exactly. Um, at the start of where we of the, the after the third halving where we are right now, um, the block reward is six point two five Bitcoin per block. Um, the price, if you set it at like something like eight thousand six hundred dollars, which is a little bit lower than where we are now, the value of a block reward has gone up from six hundred dollars to fifty three, nearly fifty four thousand um, dollars. So the reward has gone down eighty eight percent from fifty to six point two five. But the value of a Bitcoin reward has gone up 88 times. So 8,800% in that time frame. Hmm. Well, that is interesting. I, I didn't actually know that. Um, and I think that, that uh, that's actually a good place to make this comment that more and more miners are always, um, or not actually always, but there's miners that are being added to the system. And sometimes there's miners that are coming off the system. And that is because it is still an economic game. It's, it's not free money. You do have to spend energy to mine. So at a certain uh, price point, it actually becomes unprofitable to mine. And that's when certain miners fall off. And that interestingly enough is where we are right now because the block uh, halvening has happened. We've gone from 12 and a half Bitcoin block reward down to 6.25. So for some miners, because the price hasn't changed between yesterday and today, for some miners, it has suddenly become unprofitable. And uh, that obviously relates to the cost of electricity, um, your, your cooling costs, for example. So yeah, there are a couple of factors involved there. Um, is, does anyone else want to make any comments here? Question. Cool. See, there's a yeah, question. question. I don't know if you want to address it, someone, about what would happen if governments took a hostile approach yeah. To, to Bitcoin. So, so I think um, governments have taken a hostile approach to Bitcoin in the last few years. We've seen actually a lot of flip flopping. So you take Russia, Russia banned it, and then it embraced it. And uh, uh, Putin recently made some comments about how you know a true cryptocurrency cannot be uh, kind of owned or issued by a government because it's transnational in nature. So I think the, the the point being is that we've got a whole spectrum of kind of jurisdictions that are welcoming to Bitcoin and crypto, and then jurisdictions that are also um, uh, hostile. Let's put it that way. But to answer this question, you know, like Bitcoin itself doesn't do any harm to anyone, right? Um, and I think what we're seeing around the world is that there is a uh, a real desire for justice, a real desire for fairness, a real desire to advance the, the cause of humanity because we're seeing a lot of injustices all around us everywhere we look. So ultimately, if you think about what Bitcoin is, it's a language, right? It's a protocol. Uh, you need an internet connection and you need to be able to kind of transmit messages that are signed using cryptography, which is what makes it a cryptocurrency. And, and that is very difficult to eliminate uh, by just banning it. It's like banning the English language. How, where do you start to actually ban it? So what we're seeing is that uh, I think the, the regimes and the jurisdictions that uh, have a good understanding about money and about kind of uh, how this you know, Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies work, what they're trying to do is regulate it. We're seeing that in, in South Africa as well, so that they have insight into what's going on rather than just banning it completely. So um, I don't think it's possible really to ban, uh, to, to ban, I mean, it's possible to ban it, but what that will do, my view is it will push it underground. Uh, obviously you could ban a place like Valor, we're, we're a registered entity, people know who we are, they know who the directors are, etc. So you could ban Valor, but you cannot really ban Bitcoin and hope that it's gonna kill Bitcoin. It's, 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 that's unthinkable. So mm -hmm. I think, that's one of the, the major things about cryptocurrency is that it lets people take on their own financial sovereignty 
and to be able to hold their own assets without having to rely on anybody else. And in a world that's increasingly betraying the trust of citizens around the world, to be able to have full control of your financial assets is quite a beautiful feature to have. Now, again, at Valor, to be clear, you guys are trusting us to secure your funds. So I do believe that there's a place for centralized systems like Valor to be able to give people the option of helping them out with this. But obviously, others have the option to hold their assets themselves. So I, I hope that gives a little bit of color on that uh, question. Great. OK, uh, Warren, over to you. Great. Uh, yeah, so I want to talk a bit about some of the technical things um, for the halving. So uh, this was a website. I think it's thehalving.com, which you could watch um, as the blocks were mined, um, counting down to the, the last one. Um, but a lot of us watched on this website, which was mempool.space. Um, and one of the concerns was that because the block halving would be reduced or the, the halving reward would be reduced, it would mean that a lot of miners would drop offline. Now, there's supposed to be a block statistically every 10 minutes. In other words, six every uh, hour. And if you just look at this, so if we look in the last hour, uh, we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and we still have um, potentially another block uh, to come in. So. At the moment, the hash rate seems to actually be higher than what we expected it, which is, I think, a very bullish sign. Miners haven't dropped off by the looks of it. Um, we're mining more than uh, more than six blocks per hour, so that's more than one block every 10 minutes. Um, now, of course, that is going to adjust soon, and a lot of people expect a difficulty adjustment. I'll just zoom in here. So this is a handy site, which is uh, um, etc.com slash stats slash difficulty. And you can see that every approximately two weeks, the difficulty is adjusted. So if blocks are being mined too quickly, then the difficulty is made higher. And that means that um, it takes longer to mine the blocks for that hash rate. And in six days time, um, we're going to have a difficulty adjustment. Now there's a lot of talk around the halving about a minor death spiral where um, the, the time between blocks becomes incredibly large and this has never played out. Um, and you can see that the hash rate is remaining high. Blocks are still being mined faster than every 10 minutes. And um, in six days, we're going to have an, a difficulty adjustment. And it actually looks like the difficulty is going to be increased. So the adjustment is going to go up. 4% um, up is the estimate. Um, we'll see if that uh, maintains to be the case. If miners drop offline, it'll be, it'll be interesting to see. But I think that's a great sign. You know, it's a day, a day since the halving, and we haven't seen any hash rate drop off. If anything, it's higher than we expected by a long way. Um, I think you know, going into this next uh, halving, there's a there's a new kind of narrative, um, and you know Bitcoin kind of started off as an e-cash proof of concept. Um, this is a, a chart made by Nick Carter. You can look up his um, article on it yeah. on Medium. Um, and at the moment, the dominant narrative seems to be a censorship resistance uh, e-gold, which is which is a kind of a store of value, which is quite interesting. And to track that kind of narrative, you can check out the stock to flow ratio, which is probably the best quantitative model. It's tracked the Bitcoin price incredibly uh, accurately. You know, Bitcoin is almost as scarce as gold now in terms of its, its stock to flow ratio. And um, after the next halving, it'll be the most scarce widely adopted asset in the world by a long way. So if people start looking to it as a store of value, uh, we could see massive valuations. You know, the stock to flow model does predict $100,000 plus coins during this next phase. Um, again, we're not sure. It's going to be interesting to see. Um, obviously, this is not uh, trading advice or financial advice, but just check it out. So uh, Plan B wrote the stock to flow model, which a lot of people are familiar with. Uh, definitely worth looking at some interesting quantitative analysis that has gone into that. Um, and then lastly, just by way of interest, I sometimes get asked, where in the code is the halving? Mm. And um, if you actually go to the uh, the GitHub Bitcoin sites up here, um, in a file called uh, validation.c++ on line 1,238, we can actually see where the halving uh, takes place. So this is the code. Um, it's set to run 64 times. I believe there'll be a maximum of 64 halvings until you can no longer cut the Satoshis in half, but maybe someone can fact check me on that. And effectively, it just uh, shifts, it does a bitwise shift down the binary 
um, uh, down binary numbers to affect the halving in the in the C plus code. I mean, I'm not a dev, but it's it's interesting to go and have a look at it. So this is the code that has played out. This was written um, not exactly in this form, but the idea was written in 2009, 2008, 2009, and it's played out now more than 10 years later, perfectly reliably, which I think is is um, kind of amazing. So, so that means we will have 61 more halvings. Probably and, uh, the last half. Yeah, when will that is correct? Um, Warren, one question. One question. We I think people are, are generally quite interested in. I see it a couple of times coming up on the comments too. Um, is whether they should get into mining, uh, whether it's okay. profitable for an individual to do this. Can you shed some light on that? Yeah, so I've been quite involved in mining, both GPU and um, ASIC mining. Bitcoin is mined these days exclusively on. ASICs, that's a special machine that can only do the hashing uh, function for Bitcoin. Um, so I kind of run a mining fund that, that um, has a fair amount of hashing power. The main thing with, with mining is procuring uh, cheap energy because that's your main input cost. Um, you know, South Africa has some advantages. With a weak rand, it actually is an advantage to mine because our energy is relatively cheaper than it was uh, a month or two ago. Um, we, we also... Um, you can pick up quite a lot of secondhand hardware in South Africa. It's a relatively well-developed uh, mining market. But having said that, it is quite difficult to find the kinds of prices that make us globally competitive. You know, this is a very well-developed industry. This is, they're big mining companies that do mining yeah. now, like gold mining companies are moving into Bitcoin mining, which is pretty interesting. Yeah. And they are very well-resourced. They can take a very long-term view. I don't recommend you get into mining unless it's more just out of interest or unless you've got a very good deal on power. Um, you know, one interesting application is um, I actually sent a mining rig to a solar installation in Cape Town, an off-grid installation. They have too much excess solar power. Uh, yeah. So they basically monetize that and convert it into um, and convert it into electricity. So sunlight into into uh, money. Super interesting. And if there's and if there's electricity going to waste in certain parts of the world, that's an interesting application. Hmm. Uh, for Absolutely, mining. yeah. Yeah. An interesting part of our energy infrastructure. Yeah, exactly. By the way, just to clarify, I think it is 32 halvings, not 64 halvings, but I think uh, some of the comments are also uh, pointing to that. Yeah, I guess that would, cool. would make more sense given that it's... I don't know who's joined us in the chat, but that's a really weird wig. Oh, <laughs> Moderate so just, kick this guy. Maybe, yeah. maybe just on that point, just so that everybody knows, when you talk about the halvings, so there are 18.3 million Bitcoin in, in existence right now. And uh, by the year 2140, uh, I think it is, we're expected to have the last Satoshi mine. Uh, mine. A Satoshi is 100 millionth of a Bitcoin. So um, so we're expected to get the last, you know, call it uh, 2.7 or two point, just over 2.6 million Bitcoin over the next 120 years. That kind of shows how scarce uh, Bitcoin is. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Okay, great. I think we're we're coming up on the hour, and uh, this was uh, scheduled from twelve to one. I, I, I'd like to do a brief demonstration of um, of some of the buy and sell features in Valor. I think most of you are using Valor already, or if you've signed up now, this might just be useful. I understand we have a, a wide range of people in the audience. Some of you, you know, you might be professional traders, very used to exchanges. Some of you might um, not have used this at all and might be signing up for the first time. So um, uh, is it okay, guys? I'll just go ahead with a quick demo on Valor, or do you want to uh, do a closeout for the hour and then continue? Um, I think I think that's fine. Go ahead and we'll do the closeout just after this. Okay, I'll just, I'll just go through it briefly. So if you haven't logged into Valor, or even if you have, you'll know that this is the, the landing page. This is actually the wallets page uh, linked up in the top right over here. And um, this shows you firstly your Bitcoin, Ethereum, Ripple and Rand wallets. And all three of these at the bottom um, have Rand pairs. So there are developed exchanges for these. You can also instantly buy. Um, and if you scroll down, you'll see I've got a bit of a true USD position, 33 USD. Um, true USD, and from here you are actually able to um, buy uh, directly. And I understand Bella uses Bitmax to execute those trades where there isn't a rand pair. So crypto to crypto trades um, at the moment only a zero point one percent fee. Uh, Sorry, just to special. Not Bitmax, but Bitrex is our partner. Bitrex, they got Bitrex. Okay. 
Cool. Sorry about that. Um, yeah. So you can uh, go uh, buy crypto, and and uh, you know it's pretty straightforward. If you, for example, want to buy some Ethereum, you just go in here, uh, click buy. I've got um, you know I can pay from my Rand wallets. I mean, let's use Bitcoin. I wouldn't normally trade uh, Bitcoin for uh, for Ethereum right now, but who knows? Maybe it's a good call. You review the buy, uh, Vala will give you updated prices and uh, you can confirm. And that's that's kind of the easiest way to, to make a purchase um, in, in, uh, in the platform. Um, if you're using a RAND pair, so if, in other words, if you wanna just buy Bitcoin with RAND, um, I think the fee is 0.75%, maybe just correct me when you're doing the instance uh, buy. Um, so for newcomers, that's probably the way to go, but uh, you can do a bit better if you go to the exchange, uh, which we'll cover in a moment. So in your uh, Bitcoin wallet, and I've bought all my Bitcoin, so I'm going to have to actually go back to show you this. Um, actually, let me let me demo the uh, the main exchange first. Okay. So this is kind of, I spend a lot of time staring at this because I do quite a lot of Bitcoin arbitrage, which I'll speak to you about in a moment for those that are interested. Um, and yeah, so this is the, the exchange. Now, there's a few things, and again, a lot of you know this, but um, let's go through it. So this is the, the RAND Bitcoin chart. Now, these uh, bars can be set to different time increments. If they're red, it means they've gone down. If they're green, it means it went up in that time increment. And they're called candlesticks. Um, you'll also see the, um, the wicks or the thin lines between them. That shows the highest and lowest price uh, during that time interval. So it might be, um, I think these are set to, to uh, one hour intervals and um, you can see the price move. Now this big dip actually happened right at the time of the halving and it's uh, largely been recovered, which is, is quite interesting. We've had quite a bit of volatility around the halving. Now, if you have a look over here, the order book, this is uh, quite an important bit. You can see that there's quite a lot of Bitcoin um, that people want to buy. So Rand uh, seeking to buy Bitcoin. There's 15 Bitcoin, uh, 2.6 million Rand at that price of 169,040 Rand um, that people want to buy um, with Rand. There's not a huge amount of sell pressure. I mean, we have five Bitcoin here, but there's definitely an asymmetry in buy pressure. And that I think uh, uh, leads us to why we, have the, why we have the arbitrage opportunity in South Africa, which we'll we'll get to. So there's a couple ways of, of buying. The simplest is to do a market buy. And I mean, I've got 1,800 Rand on here. Okay, this is gonna be my, um, my um, order. Um, if I buy at market, uh, that means it's going to try and uh, make purchases into the order book. Now, of course, uh, there isn't actually enough Bitcoin. There's only 800 Rand for sale. So it's going to take that order and then it's going to take the a bit of the one above it. So if I place the order, um, you'll see that uh, that's going to execute. And um, I've got notifications that it was kind of bought from a number of different um, um, price points because there wasn't enough at the lowest um, price point for sale. Great, so now I've got a bit of uh, Bitcoin and just one thing on the, on the fee structure. So Vala has a different maker and taker fee structure. Uh, what that means is when you are a taker, it means that you are taking a order, uh, you're buying Bitcoin or selling Bitcoin at an already existing um, point in the order book. So someone has already put something up for sale and you're taking it. Uh, that makes you a taker. Now the fee for that is 0.2%. However, if you're a maker and everyone on the order book is a maker. Uh, so if they've put something in there, um, it means that if their order is taken, they have been the one who made the order. And in that case, your fee is um, a negative 0.1%. So you actually get paid back for trading. Now, a way to do that is we could go and try and sell and put in a limit order to be a, a maker. So at this price of 169,049, you know, I could put in half, half of the Bitcoin. And um, one note on this post only, it means it guarantees that you will be a a uh, maker on the exchange and that your order will not go in as a taker order and you'll pay the fees. So you can put in a, a sell order over here. Uh, that should go through. And now you can already see that we have a little star for my sell order over here. Um, now, if someone else goes in and buys um, enough Bitcoin, 
my order is going to be taken, making me the maker, and I'm going to get the 0.1%. So that's how the fees the fees work for maker and taker. You'll also know that both of those fees are lower than the instant buy fees. So it's always a good idea to come over to the exchange and make your make your uh, trades um, um, over there. Great. So if I just go back to the the I'm wallet gonna, screen, I'm gonna, I'm gonna interrupt very quickly and just say we have Perfect. actually someone on Twitter that's contacted us. This is the awesome thing about the Valor community. We have someone on Twitter who does not want to be named, but he said that he'd like to sponsor two prizes for 250 Rand each of, uh, of Bitcoin. So he, oh. he wants to remain anonymous, but we'll call him C, the letter C. So if you post your Valor deposit, Bitcoin deposit address in the comments and say, I love you, C, the first two people to do that will get 250 Rand each worth of Bitcoin. So close your... Valor Bitcoin address that you can get from your deposit screen and you can just show them right now Warren, that's awesome right there. If you click it, just click it so that people Am can I allowed see what to happens. enter? What's that? Am I allowed to enter? <laughs> so Spotify, this is how you get it. This is how you get it. Yeah, and just if you just click on that um, it, it will copy it. So just say post that and say I love you C and uh, and that will bring a lot of happiness to his heart just to let you know he, he has said that um, um, he'd like to sponsor 500 rands worth of Bitcoin to give away at the halving party. So that's a really wonderful gesture. Thank you very awesome. much. Thank you. All right, back to you, Warren. Great. Um, and yeah, oh. that's how you get your address. You click deposits and then you, you grab it. I don't know if someone wants to grab this question so long. Uh, yeah, why did I mean, FNB defer yet? Let me answer that. So, so uh, FNB, I used to work at the first rank group, which is uh, FNB belongs to. Um, uh, and we did a lot of great work there. Unfortunately, it didn't go forward. Uh, and that was actually the genesis of uh, uh, myself and, 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 uh, and my co-founding team left uh, Rand Merchant Bank to start Valor. Um, so post our departure, I think FNB took some decisions. Uh, won't go into all the details, but effectively FNB is the only bank in South Africa right now that has said that they have dissociated themselves, and not dissociated themselves, but they, they do not bank uh, cryptocurrency exchanges like ourselves and, and the other big cryptocurrency exchanges. Um, I've spoken to people that are very senior up in the organization, and they have suggested that it's because of a lack of regulatory uh, clarity. Uh, but we also do know that the regulators have been coming out with a very uh, robust framework, uh, which everybody, by the way, is welcome to give comments. It's on their website, the SARBs website, by, by May 15th, you can give comments. So I think the FNB has taken a very, um, a very, very conservative stance. To be very honest with you, I think they've taken the wrong stance. And I think that it's only a matter of time before FNB comes back uh, to the party, so to speak. And I, and I actually do think that there'll be a time where you will not be able to be a bank without offering cryptocurrencies to your customers. I think it is that much a part of our future. Uh, so I'm expecting to see a, a reversal of FMB's decision in the imminent future. Great. All right. Cool. Cool. I think just to close out on this, um, you know, I think the last thing is uh, around banks, bank deposits, speaking of banks. So you can go in and add a bank account. Um, you can see I've got a couple of bank accounts here. Um, add the details you have that bank has to be in your name that bank account you have to be the main um, person on it um, in order for these um, uh, deposits to work um, so if you would like to deposit to the bank account at the moment standard bank is the only one partnered with uh, valor hopefully uh, we get a few more uh, there in the coming um, in the coming months but you can make a deposit you need to paste your reference number now a lot of people are pasting their reference number here in the um in the comments this is not the address you need this is just a reference for the bank statement uh when you paste uh, uh when you send money through from the bank so you need to enter these details into your internet banking to make that transfer and then likewise um to do a withdrawal uh you'll you'll need to to head over to the withdrawal page select whatever bank account you want and um, select the, the amount you'd like to withdraw. There is an 8 Rand 50 withdrawal fee. You can do a fast withdrawal, um, then it's gonna be 60 Rand. And uh, I understand uh, Valid does processing via what they call blitz processing now. So instead of batching, uh, maybe maybe Fazam, you can talk a bit about your, your uh, 
blitz processing product that was launched recently? Yeah, well, I think everybody's heard my voice a lot. So, Baddy or, or Gianluca, do you guys want to talk about what blitz processing is? Go for it, buddy. Yeah, sure. Well, um, before blitz processing, uh, we used to um, manually process withdrawals on a regular intervals, uh, at least three times a day from ni at nine o'clock, one o'clock, and uh, five, four o'clock. But once uh, once we started automating the processing, so now we've termed blitz processing. What that means is that as soon as you put in a withdrawal instruction, we immediately send that to <clears throat> we immediately send that instruction through to the bank, straight through to the bank, so that you your money is in your bank account within a few minutes. So you don't have to wait for the scheduled uh, withdrawals. It happens on an ongoing basis, and it happens from um, Eight o'clock in in the morning till six in six uh, in the evening, uh, every single day, including uh, including Saturday. So I think uh, I think it's time for our grand prize. We're already eleven minutes past our uh, scheduled one hour. Um, uh, so this is how it's going to work. So there's a competition within a competition. So we have selected. Uh, out of all the registrations that we've had for the event, we've selected five uh, participants who hopefully are in the party right now. Uh, so we'll put their name uh, out right now. So the way it will work is that the first person amongst these five individuals who puts their deposit uh, Bitcoin deposit address in their common in the comments is the winner of the grand prize of Ledger Nano S. Are you guys ready? Wait, 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 hold on, hold on, hold on, because there have been so many people that have put their names. So you need to put the deposit address plus, what are you gonna say? What's the hashtag, buddy? <laughs> hashtag love... W for the win. Hashtag <laughs> okay? So let's put that up right there. Let me, let me just repeat, though, if someone's missed the instructions, so here's the prior competition rules. So I'm going to put out the five names that we've selected. And uh, these five individuals now have to scramble and get their Bitcoin deposit address from their Valor account and paste it into the comments. The first person amongst these five people who does that will be the winner of the Legend Nano S. OK. This Ready? address, yeah, guys. Yeah. Okay, the five selected yeah. candidates for the grand prize of Legend Nano Come S, on. Bitcoin Happy Party. Da, 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 da. All right, so it's going to come back again. So we will leave this here and we'll look out for the comments. So it's along the bottom of the page in the banner for anyone who hasn't seen it. All right, let's see. Let's see. Right. It might take a right. minute time. I think every minute, if we don't hear from these guys, we'll add another name every minute or or two, so that we can. Uh, uh, someone's asking, what was the hashtag? Just put your 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 hashtag and then uh, I mean your address and then hashtag FTW for the win. FTW. All right. Cool. Let's see. Okay, so while we're waiting for that, and by the way, I think um, just so that everybody knows, we're going to go after after this. We're going to go through the comments just to make sure that we've given the right people the right prizes, etc. So I think give us within the next week, we will get everybody's prizes to you into your Valor wallets. Um, so so look out for those. All right, back back to you. See, Mr. there's Warren. a couple of links being post, uh, being posted. I think there are, there are a, lot of, a lot of chancers out there. <laughs> I don't see the names of the winners, but they're just putting their uh, their, their their Bitcoin address. We'll, we'll definitely be verifying that. What's that? We'll be verifying that for sure. Yeah, we'll figure it out. We'll figure it out. All right, um, Warren and, and, and Satoshi Singh, back to you guys. Yeah, yeah, let's be great. Right. I think uh, that's that's pretty much everything with Vala. I don't know if there's any specific questions around using the exchange. Um, but get out there, try it out, and um, we'll talk a little bit more about it when we talk about arbitrage later, if we have time. 
So I think, uh, Crayon, over to you to <clears throat> discuss the, the uh, cold storage. So we've given away, we'll be giving away these ledgers and we're just going to talk a little bit about some of these offline wallets. Um, you know, I onboard a lot of clients for it and um, there are some misconceptions around how, how cold storage actually works. So yeah, Crayon, over to you. Awesome, thanks. All right, so let's start the discussion first with something called hardware wallets. Now, hardware wallets are actually very important um, if you are familiar with the industry. I would say that if you are simply getting into the industry, your better option is probably to use an exchange wallet, which I'll get to just now. But hardware wallets are effectively uh, cold storage. Um, it allows you to store your cryptocurrency offline. You can put your Bitcoin on a hardware wallet, for example, put it in a safe. And uh, yeah, you, you're able to manage your keys around, uh, uh, sorry, back it up. And if you lose a device, for example, you can replace the device with your uh, key, with your phrase. So Warren's going to talk about the phrase just now. I'm not going to go into detail about that. And uh, we sort of come to the, um, we, we kind of advise people that if you're holding more than half of Bitcoin, it's probably a good idea to invest in one of these. Um, I personally have a couple of them myself. Um, I, uh, you don't put all your crypto on one of them. You divide your crypto amongst different devices. It's probably better practice. Um, and a couple of examples are Trezor, a Trezor and Ledger wallets. These you can order directly. Uh, Warren's actually showing a picture of a Trezor there, um, just to give you an idea of how small it actually is. And as you can see, these devices have two buttons. It's generally selecting yes or no, or selecting a number from a list of things. So if anyone is, in, is interested in using one of these, we can help you afterwards in a discussion. All right, and predating hardware wallets uh, came paper wallets. And why this is interesting is because paper wallets are, uh, can be made by anyone. If you go to this address, bitaddress.org, anyone can produce a paper wallet. Um, this bitaddress.org is specifically for Bitcoin, I believe. Um, there are probably ones for Litecoin and other types of cryptocurrencies as well. And these wallets are a little bit cumbersome because if you want to uh, spend cryptocurrency from the wallet, you first have to take your Bitcoin off the wallet, spend what you need, and then put, put uh, your Bitcoin back onto a different paper wallet. And I want to stress that you, you want to do it on a different paper wallet because you've exposed your keys to the rest of the world once you sweep it for the first time. And um, uh, just to explain the difference between the yellow and the blue one, the yellow one is uh, does not have a uh, passphrase uh, behind it, whereas the blue one does. So if anyone is welcome to, you can actually try scan these wallets yourself and see if there's any funds on them. Um, naturally, these are examples, so I wouldn't have put any money on them. What Warren and I and uh, Lisa actually do is we actually hand these out as prizes in our courses at schools, for example. And one of the very cool things that we do is we take one wallet, we photocopy it, and we hand it out amongst all the kids. And we ask them, whoever can sweep the wallet first gets to keep all the cryptocurrency on it. So it becomes quite a competition. It's very exciting to watch. And for the first time ever, I think Warren and I actually witnessed two wallets receiving the same transaction at the same time. And that was because uh, two kids managed to sweep the wallets at roughly the exact same time. And it was up to the blockchain to determine which one actually won. So uh, it's a very interesting example. Um, yeah, and again, if anyone wants to generate one of these, you can go to bitaddress.org. Okay, then mobile wallets. These are wallets that you probably want to use for your transactional or day-to-day -day activities. Um, these are all wallets that we use, for example. And what is interesting about mobile wallets is, unlike the bank, where if you are a customer of a specific bank, you have to use that wallet for that bank. With mobile wallets, anyone, because the Bitcoin blockchain is open source, anyone can create a wallet uh, that works with the Bitcoin blockchain. So the question is, do you trust what is created? And most of the time we advise that if you are gonna download a wallet, you probably want to download one where the code for that wallet is open source. In other words, someone else can verify that the code doesn't have any bugs in it. So Exodus, uh, Metamask, uh, Green Wallet, Bread Wallet, uh, Jack's Liberty, these are some examples. Um, Metamask is actually a wallet that is used with the Ethereum blockchain. And if you are an Ethereum developer, you are very likely to come across MetaMask in your activities um, when creating products. I specifically have used it when I've created smart contracts and dApps, for example. All right, desktop wallets are another example. And uh, Warren, maybe you can chat about a bit, a bit about Exodus because you've used it more. 
All right, just before we move on, Betty, if you can, um, <clears throat> I think we need to add a few more names here. I'm not so sure if the winner is there. So if we can add uh, five more names. Uh, just check your message, by the way. I've sent you some messages. Um, so just uh, add a few more names and we'll, as we said, we're gonna, I think what we'll do is because there's a lot of comments here, we're gonna go and look at this after the fact and we'll announce on uh, social media who the winners are. Um, so yeah, and I'm also seeing a few questions about arbitrage uh, trading. So, um, so uh, Warren and, and Satoshi Singh, uh, when you've got a little bit of a gap, let's talk to uh, arbitrage trading and then we can come back to the presentation as well. Cool. All right, Warren, uh, do you have any comments on Exodus? Yeah, so uh, Exodus, um, it's, a, it's, it's a desktop wallet that I often recommend to people who don't want to walk around with uh, crypto on their phone. So I would recommend if you're going with more than half a Bitcoin at that point, you probably do want to grab yourself a, a ledger and hopefully you win one today. But I think it's perfectly acceptable to keep a fair amount of Bitcoin on a product like Exodus. Uh, it is encrypted and it works in pretty much the same way, save that it doesn't have an encrypted uh, chip on a separate hardware device. Um, so you can password protect it. It is going to give you your backup phrase, which I'll talk about in a moment. And um, I think it's just a nice way. You can store many, many different um, uh, crypto assets on Exodus. Um, you can back it up in the same way as a hardware wallet. And um, it's, a good, it's a good product, I think, to, to get started with. And I usually recommend it to quite a few um, people that are getting started. And it's also got a very good uh, interface with regards to your portfolio. It um, shows you graphs around uh, what percentage of a crypto is in Bitcoin or Ripple or Ethereum or whatever you have. And yeah, it's, it's um, very easy to use. Okay. And to talk a bit about custodial wallets. So let, let's actually make a distinction between the two now. Custodial wallets are wallets where you are effectively handing your, uh, you're, you're giving your cryptocurrency over to someone else to manage. And an example of a custodial wallet is Valor. Whereas the previous wallets that we've talked about are non-custodial wallets because you are in charge of your private keys. And uh, when, when we talk about private keys, it's like saying it's, it's the ability to prove ownership of funds. So if you have a custodial, uh, non-custodial wallet, sorry, you're able to back up your private keys and restore your crypto on various different devices. Whereas if you are using a non, uh, sorry, if you are using a custodial wallet such as Valor, then Valor is in charge of those keys. And it's um, maybe, uh, do you guys have a comment on that with regards to the security and why it might be better to uh, be introduced with a custodial wallet? Yeah, so two things. So first of all, I think we may have a winner, by the way, of the Legend Nano S. Um, uh, we'll, we'll go through that, but I think it might be, if, it's not, if I'm not mistaken, it might be Kajiso. So congrats, Kajiso, if you're there. But we'll just double check all this stuff uh, after the call or after this, uh, this live stream. Uh, going back to your question about custodial level, uh, uh, wallets and kind of what's recommended. Um, really, I think it, it really depends on the customer sophistication. And uh, I mentioned this earlier in the live stream about what their kind of knowledge is and uh, what their risk appetite is. So obviously at Valor, we place a lot of emphasis on security. You know, if, if we get that wrong, we do not have a business. Um, but uh, by the same token, if you are holding your own keys in your own uh, wallet where you have your own keys and you lose those keys, then you also don't have your Bitcoin any longer. Right or your own cryptocurrency. So if you're not so sure about how to manage your keys, I would suggest that you probably start using a custodial wallet like like uh, like Valor. But do the research so that you understand what the pros and cons are. And if you so wish, then uh, take your funds off Valor and, and keep them yourselves. Um, mm. So I just think that uh, oftentimes in the cryptocurrency community, people are saying, you know, not your keys, not your Bitcoin which is kind of the uh, a refrain that we hear uh, over and over again. And uh, while there's a, there's, a, there's a truth to that, which is you don't have control of your Bitcoin, um, obviously there are players like us, you know who we are, hopefully you've done your research on us, et cetera. But there is some security that's associated with that, with the fact that we spend a lot of our time and effort and, and infrastructure on securing cryptocurrencies. So please do your research. Uh, there's no right answer for this. If you're comfortable managing your own keys, by all means, hold your own cryptocurrency in your own wallet. And if you feel you can do it better than any custodial wallet, you should definitely do it yourself. Um, but we're still, 
it's just about risk mitigation and understanding the risk, those risks. So please educate yourself for both custodial and non-custodial wallets. Yeah. And, and, and that being said, so we talk about there will be 21 million Bitcoin in existence by the end of the halving schedule. Um, yes, the 21 million will always exist there. But some of those Bitcoin have actually been lost now because of people that are managing their private keys and have not necessarily made a backup and hence have lost those keys. So I'm not sure. It's, it's pretty impossible to actually tell how many Bitcoin have been lost to the system now. But we estimate it, I think, to be around 2 million, maybe. Um, I know there is a story of a guy, for example, who had about 7,000 Bitcoin on a hard drive and he literally threw it in the trash. And that, that's simply because he didn't have backups and he didn't realize what he was doing. And a couple of years later, when he realized what the price of Bitcoin was, he tried to search a mine dump effectively. Oh, sorry, not a mine dump, a, a rubbish dump to try and find those Bitcoin. So again, if, you, if you're not familiar with what you're doing, if you don't um, have the skills to create multiple backups and uh, 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 passphrases and things, then a custodial wallet is probably your better option for the time being. All right, uh, Warren, just, just two more things. So we're gonna talk about a mnemonic and two-factor authentication next. Um, and then yeah, great. The, uh, the arbitrage, right? Uh, yeah. yeah, so yeah, we'll get to the ob now. Just, uh, quickly on the two, on the um, mnemonic phrase. Uh, this is quite an important one. I see when people do set up their um, their cold storage, whether it's a Trezor, Ledger, or um, Exodus, it's going to ask you to write down a 12 or 24 word phrase. And I just like to explain what that is. That is uh, effectively a phrase of words, either 12 or 24 uh, words long that can be run through an algorithm um, in order to reproduce your private key. So obviously your private key, you can see at the top there, that gives you the right to spend the Bitcoin that you call yours. Um, any Bitcoin on your ledger, um, the way it actually spends it and enables you to send it is by having access to that private key. Whoever has the private key can um, spend that Bitcoin, send it wherever. If you lose it, there's no way to get it back. So an important thing about these mnemonic or backup phrases is firstly, make sure no one ever sees them. A lot of times I've had people write down this phrase, they kind of put it in a drawer and um, think that they can ask Exodus or ask Ledger to restore these um, phrases. No one can ever uh, get these back for you. So when you do cold storage, when you set up your own cold storage, this phrase is the weakest link. This is the thing you need to hide. If you lose your ledger, it's not a big deal. You just get a new ledger or you get Exodus and you type this phrase in and it will restore all of your funds and let you access them again. And yeah, the way it's generated is it goes from your private key, which is a difficult uh, thing for a human to remember and write down. You can make mistakes. Um, and it generates a 12 or 24 word um, phrase for you, which is very easy to remember, write down, or it's easy to record. And it's, uh, not, it's not going to be something that you make mistakes with, hopefully. Um, it's also good to, to test it out. Cool. Great. Now, two-factor authentication. This is actually something that is very important to me. And um, the, the reason behind two-factor authentication is an extra layer of security above your username and password. And for those of you who don't or are not familiar with 2FA or haven't set it up um, with all your accounts, it is a code that only you and a service provider um, no, and this code actually changes every two or so minutes. So let alone someone stealing your password, they also need to steal the device that has this code being generated on it to gain access to your account. And I, my, my personal story behind this is back in 2013, when I actually started trading Bitcoin on the international exchanges, I sent, I think it was around 7,000 Rand to purchase Bitcoin on these international exchanges. And I wasn't familiar with 2FA at the time. So I didn't set it up and lo and behold, within a, I think it was a week, some of the, um, actually all of that Bitcoin was stolen. So I realized, hey, you know, as, as much as I put my funds on an exchange and expected it to be secure, it was actually my fault for not following the security procedures. So whenever we do our courses, we always talk about 2FA um, and Google Authenticator, for example, is one of those uh, examples that I'm pretty sure Valor advocates for as well. Now, where if you haven't set up 2FA on your Valerix uh, wallets, I suggest you do that. Is so do so immediately, and let alone setting it up, 
you should also back up the code that gives you access to um, to your 2FA. Now, I'm not sure if Vala allows you access if you lose your 2FA or if they assist you to do this. And most exchanges probably would you would allow you to, but it is a hassle. And rather than uh, than having to contact support to do this, it's just easier to back this up. So whenever you set up your 2FA with Vala, they will show you a screen very similar to this. Um, I've obviously blanked out a code at the bottom, and the QR code would be a different QR code. But I suggest that you back it up and maybe even use a password manager for those backups. I see there's a comment on Authy. I know Vala has a position on Authy. Maybe you just want to give your opinion. Yeah. Um, so a couple of things. So first of all, we recommend that everybody institutes and enables their <clears throat> their 2FA settings. So Valor automatically uh, enables 2FA with your SMS, but that's not as secure as using a Google Authenticator, for example, as your 2FA. So uh, maybe right now, if someone on the comments can just put in the uh, some, an article from our support desk about uh, how to enable 2FA, that would be appreciated. So that should be coming up just now. But um, Authy is, is well known and it's used by, by many. Um, at Valor, we believe that with Authy, there is a situation where you could do a SIM swap and actually um, attack Authy using a, a SIM swap with, through SMS. You can't do that with Google Authenticator. So with Google Authenticator, we actually propose, we advise using Google Authenticator as our primary 2FA um, uh, app to use. So, so please go ahead and do that. Ultimately, please do your own research. But we, 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 our security team has, has advised on uh, on Google Authenticator. So, um, uh, so I think that's. I just want to mention a couple of other things. I see a lot of people asking, and I think there's not enough transparency about security on exchanges, etc. So, people asking about insurance, about hacks, and things like that. So, I think it's really important to to face the reality that these are uh, like hacks and security breaches that happened in the past to exchanges around the world. And in the future, they're, they're very likely to happen again. So uh, with Valor, we are trying to find uh, partners, insurance partners, to be able to insure the crypto that we have held, both in our cold wallet and our, our hot wallet. We'll obviously engage in those discussions. As of right now, we haven't found any insurance provider that is willing to do that. Um, it's still a very nascent industry. So over time, we hope that we will be able to find uh, uh, insurance that will be able to cover that because uh, obviously beyond our own security uh, practices, which are best in the industry and best practices in the industry, we would like to have that peace of mind. But it's important for people to know that we do not have insurance right now. Most exchanges in the world do not have insurance right now. There are a few of uh, some, like, some international ones like in the US that have been able to get some insurance. And so we want to follow in their footsteps. But again, in transparency, it's important for people to know that. Um, and therefore, obviously, if, if uh, any exchange gets hacked or there's a, some type of a breach, then uh, that's problematic. And hence, uh, what we said before is we don't have a business if we can't secure our, your, your assets properly. So be aware that we have dedicated teams in place. We use third party uh, cybersecurity experts. We actually use companies that are the uh, kind of cybersecurity auditors and advisors to the biggest banks in the country as well that help us with our, all our security procedures. So we do every single thing in our power to make sure that your funds are safe. And when I say your funds, it's my funds too. It's uh, everybody's funds. We have our own funds on the platform. So everything we do, we can do, and we're actually very confident in our security features, but no security is 100%. So Please be aware, that's one of the risks that you take, obviously, with having your funds on any type of exchange, and hence the discussion about whether you should have your funds on your own in your own custody in a non-custodial wallet or in a custodial wallet. So uh, to, wrap, to wrap that up, Valor does everything in our power to, to really make sure that all your assets are safe, um, but you should do your own uh, investigation and make your own decisions about where you hold your, your assets. We have a lot of our customers myself included, I, I, I like to keep some of my own assets on Valor. And why do I do that? To keep my interests aligned with my customers. So that if there is any type of a breach, I am also affected. So I think that's to maybe give a little bit of, of, of uh, some solace to some customers to know that our interests are aligned and we do everything in our power to secure our assets. 
So I hope that answers some of them. That's generally a difficult topic because people don't like to talk transparently about that. But hopefully you know from us that we will always kind of give you the truth and, and speak transparently about our, our security practices and what we do and what we don't do. Uh, I think just as important. Maddie or, or Jen Luca, do you want to add anything to what I've just said? Um, not necessarily, but uh, what I was uh, thinking is that we should probably formally end the program and see if anyone <laughs> wants to stay on for a session on arbitrage. Because I see uh, we uh, we are losing a few participants, so I think it would be nice to say proper goodbye, and we can still continue with the arbitrage for whoever is interested and stay on. Cool, awesome. Let's do that. All right, great. So I think. Um, what can I say? Should I play some some music? Thank you for joining our Bitcoin party. <laughs> Now, it's been a really a great pleasure having you all. Um, <clears throat> I think um, we will stay on probably for another, say, 20 minutes or so to talk about the ARB. So feel free to stay on. But we have gone over time. We want to thank you for your time. It's been a great pleasure. We will continue this. So we'll have other series. And thanks also to our partners, CoinEd. Uh, I'm sure you agree. These guys are fantastic guys. They're doing a great service to the community, especially to the to the generation uh, that's, that's, that's coming up in high schools, et cetera. So um, thank you guys very, very, very much for joining us. Um, and on that note, let's, let's head into, uh, into the arbitrage trading. So yeah, who or if we can just make a comment quickly, if, um, yeah. if you are a parent um, of kids at school, for example, then you're welcome to get in touch with us. Um, we'd love to come chat to your school about this. Uh, we're also introducing digital content now. And if you guys are interested, we're going to create a short guide um, and introdu introduction to cryptocurrency. So you're welcome to sign up at coinit.co.za forward slash sign up, and we'll send that to you within the next week or so. Cool. Awesome. Awesome. All right. So let's talk a little bit about arbitrage, guys. Um, <clears throat> let's uh, – Warren, Warren and, and uh, Priyan, you go, go ahead. Yeah, look, I think uh, it's actually quite a short discussion, and maybe we can just introduce it. Um, and then take questions, which I'm happy to field. Um, so, you know, fundamentally, there is a difference in price between the South African and the international uh, exchange rates for Bitcoin. So anyone can go and look at Vala or any local exchange, and they'll see that there's a RAND price which is being traded, and that's being set by the South African market. As we saw when we looked at uh, Vala, we, uh, we looked at the order book, and you saw there was a huge amount of buy pressure. There was more Bitcoin. Um, being desired for purchase than there was up for sale. This asymmetry creates a, a little bit of a price premium and it ranges through time. So if you go and look at, at Vela's price, I just took a screenshot before we did this. I don't know if the price has gone up or down since then, but it was about 169,500 Rand um, was the last traded price, which was approximately at the time $9,200. And that's about two hours ago. Then at the same time, when you uh, type into Google, which is going to reference the Coinbase rates, which will be very similar to the, the Kraken rate or any of these uh, big international exchanges, you're going to see that um, Bitcoin is equal to $8,700. So that's about a 440 Rand difference. And uh, that amounts to about 4.8%, which is actually quite significant. Now, of course, what one could easily do is you could buy um, Bitcoin overseas, um, sell it uh, in South Africa and realize that profit. Um, and then with the RAND that you've sold it in, you could send it back and you could buy it overseas and sell it here. But of course, um, as you probably know, that's a little bit more uh, difficult than, than one might expect. Um, so I'll just uh, show you uh, how that loop actually can work. And arbitrage is something that I think a lot of us have been involved in. I think everyone um, as an individual should investigate it. It's a, it's a good way to make a, a little bit of extra money. Um, I mean, personally, uh, I run an arbitrage bot. Um, if anyone is interested, uh, just get hold of me, Warren at coined.co.z. I'm always happy to talk uh, more about it. Um, but effectively, the way that, that this loop works, and we're going to start here um, on the South African side. So let's say you have a, a certain amount of RAND. Now, in the bottom left, we have the, the South African foreign exchange um, uh, provider. So there's a number of places where you can convert your RAND into dollars or euros to send it overseas to buy it. 
to buy a Bitcoin. Um, the main thing to realize here is that South Africa has exchange control. This is most likely the main reason for the arbitrage um, existing in the first place. Uh, because of the exchange control, it means that every South African um, is only allowed to move 1 million Rand, which is called your single discretionary allowance, often referred to as your SDA. And this allowance is the maximum amount that you're allowed to send out in a calendar year before you have to seek tax approval for amounts all the way up to 1 million. Um, and in order to do that, you actually have to have the cash in your bank to show that it's a liquid um, uh, asset that you can move um, overseas in order to get that approval. And most people don't sit on uh, that kind of RAND. And in fact, I think it's probably not a great idea to have been sitting on so much RAND for the last few months. Um, so in order to do the up to the 1 million limits, you might take an amount, let's say 100,000 RAND, and then you're going to need to find a way to convert that into euros or into uh, dollars or some other foreign currency to send it to an international exchange to buy Bitcoin at less than what you're going to sell it um, in South Africa on Valor, perhaps. Uh, there's a number of providers. Uh, you know, there's there's a few out there. You can go via your bank, but your bank is probably going to charge you 2% or so. Uh, there's some other firms out there that will send the money for you. I know um, Currency Assist is one of them uh, who will probably give you about 0.8 or 1%. Um, and uh, you know that just reducing those fees really enables you to take uh, advantage of uh, maximizing the return to yourself. So the first thing is to um, convert your RAND into Forex. And a lot of people think you need an international bank account. You don't actually need that. You can send your money, and I'll just use the example of Kraken. You can use Kraken, you can use Bitstamp, you can use Coinbase, although Coinbase won't accept South Africans uh, at the moment, so uh, you, we actually can't use that from here. Um, but you could send your, your funds to, to Bitstamp or Kraken, for example, and let's say you're using euros, uh, you're going to convert that. And on the way there, you're going to pay the 0.8% exchange fee on that 100,000 and you're going to pay 500 rand swiftly. And of course, um, you know, I think it was Andreas Antonopoulos who said the best argument for Bitcoin is an interaction with the legacy banking system. And you can see that these fees are very high. This is the most expensive part of the um, arbitrage uh, loop. Um, I see there's a question about uh, moving TUSD to exchanges instead of going the Forex route. Now, the question is, where do you procure that stable coin like TUSD or um, Tether or whatever stable coin you're after? And if you're procuring it locally, it means you're already paying the premium. So if you buy t uh, TUSD on Valor, you're already paying that, let's say, 4.8% premium. So you would need to procure that um, stablecoin internationally. And what you could do potentially is buy the stablecoin over there and sell it on a RAND-based market here. Unfortunately, we don't have any RAND-based stablecoin markets that have significant liquidity to my knowledge. I guess there are some exchanges out there that I might um, not be aware of. But you, you might need to look around just to reach the kind of liquidity to enable you to make that, that transaction. So yeah, getting back to the, the international arbitrage, uh, once your euros arrive on the exchange um, in, in uh, let's say, in Europe, uh, in euros on Kraken, you're going to procure Bitcoin. Now, of course, this does take time, and this is where the big risk comes in, is that you've sent your RAND out, and in the time it takes to get um, into euros on Kraken, you're taking a risk on RAND moving against euros, and it can move against you. I mean, we've seen the RAND move 2% in a day sometimes. So if you think you're going to get 4.8%, suddenly you've lost 1.5% of fees and the RAND could move 2% against you. Um, there's not really much left. Uh, so we'll talk about hedging in a moment. Then from the international exchange, once you've bought Bitcoin, you have to send it back to uh, Valor. Um, and along the way, you're going to pay a withdrawal fee. You're probably going to pay about a quarter of a percent on the exchange like Kraken. I think Bitstamp's half a percent. Um, and and uh, then you're going to withdraw it and send it back to, to the South African exchange like Valor. Um, along the way, that is going to take a little while because obviously you have to get um, uh, two blocks mined. So I think Valor accepts two confirmations. So it's at least 20 minutes, um, probably closer to half an hour to one hour because of the time it takes the exchange to actually batch your transaction. Um, so you're probably waiting half an hour to one hour for your um your Bitcoin to arrive in South Africa. Once it arrives in South Africa, you're going to have to sell it at a premium. Um, now, of course, Bitcoin is even more volatile than the RAND and it could have moved in that time as well. So it can be a bit risky in the sense that you do expose yourself to Euro um, risks and then 
um, uh, uh, Bitcoin fluctuations in the time that that you um, have been sending the funds around. So there is a way to hedge against this, and that is to leave equal amounts on each side. So if you put RAND in your South African foreign exchange account, you put um, Bitcoin on the South African um, cryptocurrency exchange, and then you put euros on the international exchange. Now, of course, you need three times as much capital. Um, and this enables you to buy and sell all the assets at the same time. And you take no time risk um, of, of, uh, of doing this. Um, so th that is a way to, to kind of hedge it out. But of course, you do have to put more capital at risk uh, in order to do this. The arbitrage fluctuates uh, a fair amount through time. You know, we have seen in December, it was very high. I think the RAND was quite strong. There was a lot of buy pressure in Bitcoin to try and use it as a rail to get RAND out into dollars. Um, and uh, I think there were a few trading days that month. So there weren't many people who could be running the arbitrage loop to be providing sell pressure in South Africa. So we saw the arbitrage go as high as about 10% um, for most of the last half of that month. So that was uh, incredibly good. Um, however, the arbitrage has been quite low, um, let's say for the past three months. I think the things that affect it firstly and primarily is a weakening RAND. When the RAND, when the RAND weakens, uh, you you sort of see the arbitrage dip. So it's probably only hanging around three and a half percent now. And bear in mind, one and a half percent of that is is fees. Um, so you, you you are probably going to struggle a bit to get a decent return there. The other time that it goes very high is when we have a big dislocation in the market, like happened in March when the stock market crashed. Bitcoin uh, you know dropped off thirty percent um, pretty much overnight, and around that time. Uh, when there's a big dislocation like that, a big drop in prices. Um, I mean, we saw the arbitrage go up to about 16% for a day or two. So it is worth hanging around. Um, it is worth using bots, perhaps. Um, and you're welcome to contact me. Um, I see there's a question, uh, did, did I program my own arbitrage bot? So <clears throat> actually commissioned someone uh, in Europe to, to um, build it for us and uh, yeah, I think it's it's uh, something that works pretty well. So um, there's another kind of arbitrage. Maybe I should see if there's any more questions about uh, um, local um, about international arbitrage from the from the audience. I don't know if anyone's identified any questions. I think maybe just one thing just to recap. So first of all, right now the international arbitrage I just checked is about it's just over three percent right now. It's sitting around three percent. So um, uh, and I think if I believe, I think that's probably net of fees. So the, the the arbitrage is definitely there, and obviously just so everybody understands the basic concept of arbitrage um, is is basically you always want to in trading buy low and uh, sell high, right? And so if you ever have an opportunity to buy the same thing low and sell it high at the same time, then you lock in a profit, okay? And that's kind of like arbitrage is technically like risk-free profit, okay? So you can do that on, on uh, the international exchanges. And here we've got a, a structural constraint, as was mentioned before, because of exchange control. So it really limits the amount of money people can uh, take out of the country to buy Bitcoin and then to sell back into the country. And there's a big kind of a surge of demand uh, within the country to buy Bitcoin locally, even though supply is constrained, which, which leads to that structural premium that we're talking about. By the way, I've seen that structural premium about three, four years ago. It was, it's, it's, on some days, it was about 30%. Uh, in Zimbabwe, uh, it's about 100%. Um, so it really just depends on, on the, it's just market forces and market dynamics. And then to, um, to, to the point about uh, arbit international arbitrage, there's also local arbitrage. So there are other local exchanges within South Africa that people do use. And if you have some money on their exchange and some money on Valor, for example, and there's a dislocation of the price, you can buy low and then sell high and to, to kind of uh, take advantage of that discrepancy. But please understand that you need to take into consideration fees as well. So it's not just looking at the price you have to understand what the fees are, so what your net amount will be after you buy, you sell, and you, you transfer your funds wherever you need them to be. So can you just repeat that part about hedging, please? Was that me or was that you, Warren? Uh, I think that was for me. So 
uh, you know, what you want to do is you want to hedge against the time risk in these different currencies. As I said, if you're doing this loop and you are sending euros and you have to wait a day or two for them to arrive, um, you know, the rand could strengthen in that time. And then you're not going to get 100,000 rand back at the end of this loop. You're going to have lost 2,000 rand if you if the rand has strengthened 2%. Um, likewise, if in the time that it took you two hours to send Bitcoin back from the international exchange to Vala, you know, Bitcoin could have dropped 10% in that time. It's very volatile. And then you've lost money doing that. So one way to hedge this is to actually put euros on the euro exchange, i.e. Kraken or Bitstamp, um, and to put uh, Bitcoin on Vala so that you can buy and sell instantly. So you're going to start out with uh, euros over there. And let's say you buy one Bitcoin um, and you're going to start out with one Bitcoin on Vala and you're going to sell that. So you'll have started with um, and then you can instantly withdraw that and uh, book the return leg. So you're going to start out with a certain amount of RAND that um, instantly gets sold for that same amount of RAND um, on the South African exchange where you can then take your bit of profit. Um, so you don't spend time in the markets um, exposed to euros or to or Bitcoin because uh, the amounts that you start with don't change because you're buying and selling them all at the same time. So again, you do need to keep uh, euros on that international exchange. You need to keep Bitcoin on the South African one. And then you ideally to really hedge it out, you need to also keep um, uh, RAND on the on your, your foreign exchange um, accounts or provider so that you can instantly buy and sell all of those at the same time. If you are interested, uh, you're welcome to just get hold of me. Um, I'm very happy to just send me a message, send me an email. I'm happy to uh, talk people through this. Well, I just answered this question up on the screen right now, uh, which is, do you think buying BTC on a Zara exchange will ever count toward one's SDA regarding exchange control? <coughs> so right now, this is exactly what the regulators are discussing about putting a framework in place. Um, and also right now, by the way, just so that you know, <coughs> It's clear from the current regulations that uh, uh, exchange control is a law of the country. And so if you're trying to evade exchange control in any way, um, just be careful because it's a law and which, whether you use it taking cash out the country or gold or uh, whatever it may be, um, I'm not sure actually gold counts. I think it does count a little bit. Um, you, you need to just be careful that you're not uh, contravening exchange control regulations. So, um, we're excited um, about the fact that there may be some uh, carve-outs in the new regulations to bring more liquidity uh, into South Africa despite exchange control. But uh, please be aware of the exchange control requirements uh, if, if for individuals, that is. All right? Individuals need to, need to think, think about that and make sure that they're, they're remaining within their 1 million or within their, their, their 10 million. But what we are trying to tell the regulators is that if you come and you say you deposit a million rand, let's say if you had a million rand and you buy Bitcoin on Valor, and then the next day you sell it, uh, that you should that shouldn't, or you just hold it on Valor because Valor is a South African-based entity. It shouldn't count towards exchange control uh, because you're not trying to, you're not taking your capital anywhere, right? Especially if you sell it and then you withdraw your rand. A day after or whatever it may be so those discussions are still ongoing with the regulators we will have clarity in the next few months i would assume about what the, those are uh, and, and i'm sure we'll, we'll let the our customers know once we have more clarity but right now there isn't any uh, hard and fast rules to do with uh, uh, exchange control of cryptocurrencies beyond the overarching framework of, of abiding by by uh, um, exchange control I've seen quite a lot of questions uh, around tax in South Africa, firstly, with regard to arbitrage profits, and secondly, with regard to tax treatment. I mean, maybe I can quickly talk about um, taxing arbitrage profits because it's the easier one. And maybe, I don't know, someone else can dive into general taxation around um, Bitcoin and uh, digital assets locally. So uh, with arbitrage, you know, the way South African tax law works is they see anything where you've applied your labor as income tax. Um, so if I build a website and I get paid internationally for that website, they see that I've applied my labor in South Africa and therefore I should be um, taxed in South Africa for that income. And this is exactly how trading is seen. So if you make a trading profit, maybe you know you sold a bunch of Bitcoin right before the halving dip, you made 10%. 
um, in theory, that is uh, considered a taxable income uh, under income tax because you applied your labor. You didn't hold the asset for a very long time. Um, now, I've had multiple tax opinions um, for arbitrage profits, depending on where you keep them. There's no doubt if you are taking arbitrage profit in RAND that it is seen as income tax. Likewise, um, from what I have spoken to tax lawyers about, if you take your arbitrage profits in um, in uh, Forex, like euros or, or dollars, and because that is considered uh, legal tender, that will also be seen as an income. Um, if you take it in Bitcoin, I've had competing opinions. So on the one hand, the more cautious conservative thing to do is to say, well, SARS most likely will see it as income tax um, if you've taken your profits in Bitcoin. But I have also had a competing opinion which suggests that taking your profit in Bitcoin will only be taxed at the time of disposal of that asset. So if you hold it for two years and you sell it, um, then it will account for income tax. But again, um, that is the that is a, an outside opinion that I've, I've received. Cool. Guys, it's it's getting late. We, we've gone way over the one hour. We, we're approaching the two hour mark. Um, Warren and Krian, was there anything that you felt that you had to get through? I think we're at Q and A, and we've kind of been going through the Q and As. Um, maybe let's just have our concluding thoughts uh, and, and just go through the team or the panel here. Um, so that's that's um, so that we can just kind of call it a day. Um, so um, maybe let's start with G. You've been very quiet there. Let's let's hear your concluding, <laughs> your concluding thoughts here. Yeah, I lost my hat. That's the problem, I guess. Um, so <laughs> so uh, I guess like the point of this whole discussion was that it is our halving party. Um, I think I think it's fantastic to see that the Bitcoin network will go chugging along, as we expect. Um, and I think it's also just really amazing that something like Bitcoin has managed to achieve 2% of gold's kind of valuation in, in, in about 10 years. Um, so it's a really exciting industry to be in. Um, happy halving Bitcoin. Um, looking forward to the next to the next one. Um, so thanks everybody for joining too, um, and to the Coinet guys. Uh, this was super educational. I learned some things too. Um, I think that, that that's it from me. Awesome, Betty. Let's hear your concluding thoughts. Well, I must say this was a really happening party, especially with the hats. Uh, <laughs> Didn't want to be very business-like or corporate-like, and which is which is the spirit of Bala. We want to be friendly. We want to be of service to uh, to the community. So, I really hope everybody enjoyed. I personally learned a couple of things from the Coinet guys. Thank you so much uh, to Warren and uh, Satoshi Singh. I uh, from now on, I'm going to call Kriyan Satoshi Singh, which is going to be a great. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you. Thanks, Coinet guys, and uh, yeah, so I, I really enjoyed it, and uh, I think we we will do um, more frequent live streams uh, going forward. Cool, awesome. and Warren. Yeah, I enjoyed this. I think uh, um, we enjoy teaching, and uh, we'd we'd always like to get out there specifically into schools, uh, teach the next generation of hodlers, investors, and developers. And I mean, I really, I've enjoyed using Valor. It's a small fact, it was launched on 11th of June. That sort of, if you look back, I started the bull run when we came out of the depths of the three $4,000 mark. So go back and check it out the day they launched. That was also my birthday. Um, so I remember it well. And, um, you know, Bitcoin's been doing very well uh, since then. Um, I really enjoy the Valor Exchange. I use it a lot for arb trading. And um, it's cool to see South African markets so well developed. We're actually very fortunate here. Um, you know, in other other countries in Africa, they don't have as many um, exchange options. Most countries in the world, in fact, don't. So I think we're very lucky to have such a well-developed exchange market in South Africa. And yeah, here's to the next four years. We'll we'll see you uh, at block uh, eight hundred and forty thousand. Cool. And 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 uh, Kriyana, otherwise known as Satoshi Singh, your last comment, please. <laughs> Yeah, I think um, this is incredible fun. I think, honestly, uh, being being in the industry for so long now, every event that we always have is incredible fun in the crypto industry. So it's um, it's interesting to meet new people, to answer the questions, um, obviously play uh, play around with the different technologies that are coming around. So 
I think we're only going to go from strength to strength. Um, also, one comment that I want to make, especially with regards to how the halving went, it was perfect. There, there were no flaws. We didn't really see any problems there. Uh, the, the code works. Bitcoin works. It is a proven use case of cryptocurrencies. So, yeah, it's, it's going to be an exciting future, I believe. Awesome. And uh, I saw there a couple of uh, requests for some music, so I'll give my, my final my final oh, comments to a oh, little bit of uh, <laughs> some music. I don't know if you can but um, I think from my side, I've really enjoyed being with you, and also like Valor is is really an entity that tries to do its best to serve humanity. So I think especially at this time with the difficulties that we're seeing across the world. It's time for us to really have a spirit of service in everything we do to recognize the oneness of humanity and to really realize that the only way that we're going to get through the crises that we have as a world is to, uh, uh, as corny as it sounds, is to infuse a little more love in our relationships, in uh, both corporate, personal, etc. So I think Bitcoin halving is just a, a little bit of a trigger for us to have a little bit of fun with you. Uh, I've seen a lot of questions about uh, kind of having more of these sessions than we will. And I saw someone talking about um, arbitrage in a, as if it was in a Chinese language, mm -hmm. but uh, we'll try to create a little bit more transparency in some more of these events so that we can uh, uh, really educate all of you. So thank you so much for having uh, your confidence in us. Thank you for sharing your time with us. Thanks very much to the CoinEd guys uh, for being with us. And uh, that's a wrap, gents. Maria, to your whatever you feel like, end the broadcast. <laughs> Cheers, guys. Okay. Cheers. Yeah.